Politic 3 program is reinstated. Open sesame! Commander Klingon vessel. We are energizing transport of evil. Now. Welcome, everyone. This is Star Trek from the Holodeck. I am Michael, the captain of the USS Rayman Digital, and on the bridge with me is Ensign David Sabal. Hello, everybody. If you're a new listener to our show, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search from the holodeck and be sure to leave us a review in itunes we need those our listenership has increased quite a bit over the last several years but we're not uh, seeing those reviews so please do so even if you hate us no one wants I, to talk to us i are, are we scary are we <laughs> morons <laughs> it's or a, perhaps we're too intelligent for people uh, <laughs> oh i do not think that's the case if you listen to the ending of our last discussion <laughs> I th think I think the jig is up after that whole entire yes. discussion. I think people are well aware there's zero intelligence going on in this studio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. So this episode, just wow. I mean, where do we begin with an episode like this? This was an extremely ambitious episode. Oh, this could have been the episode that broke the series, dude. The series? This could have been the episode that broke the franchise. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I say ambitious. A canon-defining relevant episode that retrospectively changed major components to the cosmological underpinnings of Star Trek canon while also, and this is the key aspect here, while also working in conjunction with established canon in order to justify and support the story direction and the canon recontextualization. Yes. Such as the concept and inclusion of the temporal wars, temporal agents, and number one, the iconic origin story of Khan. Of Khan, yeah. Especially since, you know, like, this is something that, if you look back at the original series, a lot of the quote unquote times that were given by canon where things had to happen obviously are a little dated. I mean, we were supposed to have a World War Three by what, 1996? I think it was. No. Or it was like it was supposed to be in the 90s, I thought. No, the eugenics war. We'll, we'll eugenics get, war. We'll the get, eugenics we'll war get into like, that. Yeah. yeah. And like, when you think about it now, it for what they did, it was really interesting and scientific. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what are you, Popeye? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Scientifically, it makes sense when they gave the explanation about the temporal war and how it affects the temporal framework of Star Trek. Yeah. I'm a little suspect of the science there, but you know what? It's all right. We know time travel now has just been a thing in Star Trek. And oh, yeah. I think most of us at this point are willing to swallow some of the the ideas that they use or justifications they use mm -hmm. for their time travel elements. And this is just another example of that. And it is passable, but also very fucking dangerous. The balls on the writing team. Yes. For doing something like this. It takes big balls because I would not want to venture into this territory. However, they did. And only time, David, will tell. It's hard to even tell if what they did is going to work. Oh, yeah. Because it works in the context of this singular episode. But how is everything else going to now fall into place? And that is a big component to our discussion that we'll get into in just a moment. But the big highlights... The con aspect had me nervous at first, but in the end, the way they explain things and the implied 
strings of fate, that which seemed to keep things how they should be despite the continual interference of the timeline or with the timeline. I like this because it privileges the prime timeline as how things should, should and be. must be, yes. whereas the others are simply strands of time that possibly never should have been, and and we'll get into this yeah. in just a moment as well. It's very much kind of like the original concept of the mirror universe. The mirror universe was supposed to be this broken offshoot of our time. Well, and it was also called the mirror universe because it was supposed to represent a, a reflection a fl- of yes. how humanity could have ended up. Have ended up. Yeah, it was a philosophical writing device. It turned into something more about just having fun. Mm-hmm. Deep Space Nine pretty much turned it into that. Enterprise oh, oh. embraced it. And, yes, and it and, and I'm not. That's not a negative. It might sound like I'm being a little negative about it. I'm not. I love the Mirror Universe uh, episodes. They're some of my favorite. Um, also, Paul Wesley's Kirk is back, and they used him perfectly, especially when you realize that in a lot of ways, this feels like a companion piece to The City on the Edge of Forever. It does, especially but, when you get to that ending. Yes, but there's an emotional role reversal. The lost love or love that never should have been was swapped for Laan and Kirk instead of Kirk and Edith Killer. Edith Killer. Which is one of my absolute favorite episodes, by the way, of Star Trek. It was written by the great science fiction writer Harlan Ellison, one of my absolute favorite writers. And just side note here, for people that have not read the actual script that wasn't produced, but it was recently adapted. Yes, into a graphic novel. Into a graphic novel, you have to read it. It is one of the most beautiful Star Trek stories I have ever read. And depressing. And depressing. <laughs> and uh, even though the original episode, or the, I should say the episode we actually got that, that was produced, what is a magnificent episode. It has the heart of what the original script was supposed to be. But Harlan Ellison was known as a bit of a hard case, and he didn't budge, so he wrote what he wanted without thinking of budget. budget. And the fact that this is on television in the 1960s, and he wrote an episode that was just too big. Yes. And there was also some things that Gene Roddenberry and Harlan both butted heads on, and it had to do with just the views of the Federation and how Roddenberry wanted this utopia to be presented and the way Harlan Ellison had presented it in the specific episode uh, according to Roddenberry, contradicted everything. A lot of things because yeah. you had a, a, a drug dealer involved in the story. Yes. <laughs> so, so also, David, this is peculiar. This will be another thing we'll probably get into if we have time. No Pike again. It but seems it didn't hurt the episode. No, and I I know it didn't. That's the thing. <laughs> But it seems a bit strange. It's a strange decision to open what is essentially the first quarter of the season with no Pike-centric episodes. Even the last one. Pike was there. He was present. Yes. But it was about Una. Pike was maybe in... He had an actual, I guess, talking scenes, maybe a total of six, seven minutes Even of screen time. Even then. Yeah. It seems weird. And that's not a complaint. It's just an observation. And I want to circle back to this. So I'm hoping we do have time because I'm wondering if it has to do with some of the, I'm going to say obvious direction they're taking this series. Uh-huh. I'm going to put a pin in that, Dave. Okay. Because that obvious direction, little preview here. My theory is, is that they're working towards changing or redoing the original series. That's what it seems like they're working towards. Okay. And that may seem sacrilege at the moment, but after I explain what it seems like their intention or their desire is, it will start making a lot more sense. Yeah, so before Star Trek fans out there actually are get their pitchforks ready, you know, give us a moment to explain. Yeah. And I'm not saying this is a good idea. I'm not advocating this idea. If they do it right, it could work. But I'm presenting a theory based on my own analysis of what they have been doing with, or I should say based on what they've been doing in season one 
and the direction they're taking in season two. I'm going to I'm gonna put a, a little extra spice on that. You know say, what I'm talking about, right? I, I think okay. I do, and I've thought about this, and I'm actually on board with this idea. Of course 100%. you are. You love anything controversial, David. <laughs> Especially when it comes to Star Trek. <laughs> All right, so what were your highlights, David, briefly? Oh, my God, dude. There was a lot of great moments in this episode. I love the portrayal of Kirk, absolutely. I think that if Paul Wesley is our replacement Mm -hmm. for Captain Kirk, I would be happy with that. Because, like, dealing with Kirk, especially in Strange New Worlds, was a very dicey subject. Or any Star Trek fan, because we don't want Kirk's legacy being tarnished. But instead, in this episode, I feel that they added elements to Kirk's legacy now. Getting a getting a, a gauge of his relationship with his brother, which has always been a meme for Star Trek fans. Now we're getting more context in his relationship with Sam. And they're are we that. though? Are we though? Because so far, every Kirk we've had is not really our Kirk. Is not really our Kirk. But from what we saw in the in the end, yeah, you kind of get a gauge that basically, yeah, there is a relationship with right. Kirk and his brother. Mm-hmm. It it and hopefully, maybe if we get more of Paul Wesley, we'll we'll get to actually deal with that. I think that. Everyone's worried about like Kirk running into Spock this early, but I'm like going, they can, they've proven in this episode they can write Kirk and he can never meet Spock. Dude, these writers know how to dance. They, they have, know how to dance. They put their dancing shoes on before they all before they all sit down to write. They put on their dancing shoes because they dance around canon like it ain't no thing. Like and it ain't they, no thing. And they do it right. And they and that's the thing is like. I think we're gearing up for a moment in Strange New Worlds where Kirk will meet Spock for the first time. Mm. And basically in their well in it, in their <laughs> history. If we're going with what I think they're doing, then possibly. Yeah. And that's why I'm like going that just the whole Kirk element was a highlight for me because it opened the possibilities and everything. But what's your next highlight? My next highlight has to actually honestly be the parallel story that you mentioned from the get go, dude. Yeah, I saw the elements of you know the city, the on city the of the edge of forever. forever. Yeah, especially when they talk about how Leanne's future has to happen, and Kirk starts talking about, well, if this happens, then I'll never exist. Yes, that that was the moment when I said, oh shit, this it's is the like city, the city on the edge of forever. forever. Yeah, and it was like so funny because I I kept thinking to myself, oh, they're gonna have this moment now where Kirk is going to have sex with Leanne. Oh shit! I kept waiting because I'm going, come on, get that old Tiberius <laughs> magic going. Tiberius He's magic. gonna have to have sex with Leanne. Are you are you ready to meet little Tiberius, Leanne? <laughs> Tiberius. Well, his name's Little Tiberius, but he ain't little. Now, now we didn't get there unfortunately because there was not enough time. But uh, if given time, dude, I honestly think Kirk would have actually seduced Leanne easily. <laughs> well, yeah, but but also, the, even though we all want to say. Uh, Kirk and his swagger wins over the lady. Wins over once the again. lady. <laughs> Absolutely, it's the Kirk. It's the charm of Kirk. Th- that's the thing about him. That's why he's always been a ladies' man. But there's also so much more to it than simply, oh, Kirk is so dreamy. It was also the fact, and this was the big, the big point for me, was that Leanne's attraction to him was that she felt that she can be herself with him, with him, because she knew nothing. Because he knew nothing of her. There was none of that baggage that came with her last name that produced preconceptions. And there was just like this natural charisma with Kirk where it's like yeah. he didn't have any pressures on Leanne. La- you know, Leanne. Leanne. But like seeing Kirk. La- Leanne. <laughs> seeing Kirk actually hitting on Leanne with a hot dog for hot dogs was actually hilarious to me. Very like going, yeah, this is what Kirk is. This is how he's going to win her over. It's not with the swagger. Um, it's just that natural charisma and He's just a casual type of casual guy. Casual dude. He's a casual. That's that's what's that's the big difference with Kirk. A lot of people 
think that he's like this rogue that breaks the rules. He mm-hmm. isn't. He he, isn't. he very seldom he very seldom breaks the, the rules. In fact, I think Picard at this point has broken rules more than Kirk. Oh, easily. The thing is, is Kirk has this casual demeanor that sells the idea of this rogue individual. That individual. he is a rogue. But he just has a casualness. He's very um, charming. He doesn't stick to protocol in the way of when it comes to conversing with individuals. With individuals. Yeah. So, and let, let's get into the actual heart of the discussion here. So, the synapses, Laanne travels back in time to 21st century Earth to prevent an attack which will alter humanity's future history and bring her face to face with her own contentious legacy. Directed by Valerie Weiss and written by Dana Horgan. So La La Ann being at the forefront of the episode really helped to add those additional layers to her characterization, which gave us a greater understanding of her current emotional state and the insecurities she harbors. And these are things that they have used already throughout the last what 12 episodes of strange new worlds these have always been things that have been defining for her character from the beginning but now we're digging deeper and we're really fleshing out her insecurities and the issues that she has when it comes to herself and the and the fact that she feels judged that's why she's isolated that's why she's lonely because she feels that others are judging her based on her heritage or her yes. ancestry. And her ancestry with with someone who is very infamous in Star Trek lore. Yes. I and think that's why it was like really cool the the fact that La uh, Anne basically got won over by Kirk because partially Kirk's never heard her surname. He's not familiar with Khan. Yeah, and, that, that, I mean, that's that's the basis of their connection. In a lot of ways, it had to do with with the fact that he didn't see her for anything other than who she, who is, she is as a person, as that individual standing in front of him, you know, independent of her ancestral heritage. You know, not having the baggage, as I said a few moments ago, that generates unfavorable preconceptions. That's something that she's not used to. That's why when she looked at Kirk and she didn't, and he didn't know who she was, there was this sign of relief that she can actually sit next to someone, have a conversation, and not think in the back of her mind that they may be judging her or possibly scared of her based on her last name. Yes. You know, not being judged on her parentage or ancestral line, but on who she is. Yeah. That's what she has always wanted. That's what's becoming clear as we continue to delve into the La Anne eccentric episodes. Which I thought that basically coming off of the last episode was genius because yeah. you came off of a story, yes, of a separate character of Una. But, but the pretty theme, much the same theme. Yeah. It's the th- same theme and tied to the same same core history of Star Trek, which is the eugenics war. And, you know, the, the idea of eugenics. And then basically... Coming from that really strong episode to this episode, where we get to see this is what this is, you know, this character is going through it. Yeah, and it's different. It's a different. And the thing I love about love about Strange New Worlds is they're showing us different perspectives of everyone. You don't get like this cookie cutter feeling when they say, "Oh, we're gonna do a story based on eugenics." Okay, this is a character's. A character's thoughts on it, yeah, and then follow it up with another episode of a different character, but they have the same thoughts, right? <laughs> right. Well, David, this goes right back to what um, the uh, executive producer of Strange New Worlds had said before the show even hit the airwaves. He said that they're going back to the original format with a caveat: we're going back to serialized format, but we're going to maintain a sense of consistency throughout the episodes, and that's why I keep saying it's basically a hybrid serial. It's a lot like the later seasons of Deep Space Nine. Yeah. You know, where you have, yes, individual episodes, but there's still a general story that's revolving that keeps the overall season consistent. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what Strange Strange New Worlds is doing, either by theme or actual overt story. Mm -hmm. And you know what's even more interesting? Yes, we did have Pike in the episode, 
but we still had the overall element of Pike's story, which is ta- uh, his whole story up to this point is talking about the importance of everyone else's legacy, right? And we get here in this story that same theme again, where it's basically the importance of Captain Kirk's legacy, where the, the prime timeline is what has to follow through. Him being just simply the captain of the Enterprise isn't enough. Yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily about Kirk and Pike necessarily, but your point is, let me see if I understand your point. Your point is that that everything seems to be pointing to fate. Fate, yeah. yeah. And like everyone or, or has, perhaps destiny. Everyone has their own destiny that they gotta they have to fulfill. Correct. I, I do like that. If that's the if we look back, let's say in I don't know, ten years, fifteen years down the road, and we look at Strange New Worlds, just like we do with all of the other past Star Trek series, you can usually pinpoint a general theme for every series. Maybe two or three throughout the entire run. Chances are with Strange New Worlds, the theme we're gonna point to is fate. Is fate and destiny. And I think that that could be really strong absolutely for a for for a for a show that essentially everyone was just th- had this really bad taste in their mouth thinking that this was simply going to be a prequel type of series mm-hmm. but when you put context behind it about destiny and fate then a prequel series works because you're emphasizing the strength of what was put before us yeah yeah, the writers did a really good job when it comes to everything you had just talked about so far in connecting the dots and maintaining that that theme, the consistency across the last what I don't know thirteen episodes of Strange oh, yeah. New Worlds. It's it's working. I like it. This one, this one though, just on a side note, for me, the question of Le Anne's at the very end. And this is just me as a fan thinking about this. If I had the choice to kill Khan, Mm -hmm. it's almost like the same adage, would you go back in time and kill Hitler? Yeah. And I'm like going, well, yeah, I would. (laughs) That's that's why I was looking at this. I'm like going, I like the element that they threw in here to kind of spice up that that philosophical thought. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely the exact same thing. Because it's the exact same thing. The, the, The caveat... To it is La Anne's legacy was in question because if she gets rid of Khan, who is she then? Or what that's a good point to because her? we know that she would pres- that based on the technology that she had, the Romulan agent told her that she that protected. device would protect her from any timeline changes. So she had a free pass. She had a free pass, but she didn't do it because also, I mean, as a Star Trek, or I should say, as a Starfleet officer. You know, we like to hold them up in high regard when it comes to their morality. And for her to do something like that, you could argue, is anti-Federation and highly unethical, (laughs) you know. (laughs) So because other people's lives are in jeopardy and who knows what I mean, it's the whole it's consequentialism is what it is. Yes. That is exactly what it is. Like, would you go back and prevent America from dropping a nuke or uh, the atomic bomb on Japan. I mean, you might save people at that moment, but there has been numerous studies now showing that millions and millions of people's lives were saved by doing that. that. Exactly. That atrocity saved millions of people. So it's definitely one of those philosophical questions that are not easy to answer because there's probably no there's no easy answer. <laughs> there is for no it. easy answer. But yeah. The, the amazing thing that what they did here in this episode, I've seen so many sci-fi shows try to tackle that that question. Yeah. And it pretty much eighty percent of the time falls flat. Um, if someone asked me to go back in time and have sex with uh, Jerry Ryan prior to her fame, <laughs> prior to her fame, <laughs> I, I'm all in. You're like going. And I'm a consequentialist. It's for the greater good. (laughs) (laughs) Who is greater good? Who's greater good? Who knows? (laughs) That's a whole other philosophical question I can't be bothered with. It's my greater good. Yeah, it's my my world. (laughs) 
Little Tiberius wants to get wet. <laughs> little Tiberius wants oh. to get wet. Oh. That's being cut. That's the most disgustingest <laughs> thing ever. Although, th that still cracked me up that basically they're long freaking names for Kirk and his brother. Where That was a good joke. Yeah, there was a lot of good moments There like was a that. lot of good moments. Very... I'm not a big comedy guy, but when Star Trek moves into those classic Star Trek moments of levity, it's something about Star Trek. It, it works. Well, dude, 99% of the time, it works. That that beginning of that episode gave me Star Trek four vibes so much. Yeah. Especially when Kirk is like trying to figure out how to make a door work. And I haven't, <laughs> I haven't lived on Earth. I was born in the spaceship. <laughs> and I'm like going, this is very reminiscent of yeah. Star Trek Four comedy. And you know, none of that would have worked if it wasn't for, um, if it wasn't for Paul Wesley. Paul Wesley's Kirk was even better this time around. It was fun to see Kirk in the season one finale. It was. But this episode really gave Wesley a chance to play Kirk within a far more dynamic setting. Yes. He's playing Kirk well. It's it's his own take. But where it matters, he's relying on the go-to Kirkisms. Yes. He's not trying to play William Shatner. He's trying to be Captain Kirk. Yeah, he's trying to keep with the characteristics, which is Kirk has a swagger about him, a certain little bit of an arrogance and there's an air to him and you're you, you're right the, the the overall air to him his the his persona that he permeates is captain kirk captain kirk it may not be william shatner and all of his mannerisms and gestures and let's be honest none of us want that no because it, then it becomes a spoof it becomes a spoof or a parody and William Shatner is William Shatner, and it works for him. The way he played it was fantastic, and it will always be iconic. It will, it will always be my favorite. But you can't imitate that. You, all you can do as an actor, so you don't get laughed at, is try to capture the essence of who that person is. Yeah. And Paul Wesley has done his homework. He has studied the essence of Kirk. Like I said, the season finale last season, it wasn't enough to gauge whether or not he really had it down. I definitely felt like he was on the right track, but this episode proves that he does have it. Oh, absolutely. He does absolutely have it. He has the charm. He has the arrogance. He has the swagger. He has that swashbuckling uh, ca uh, casualness to his whole entire self. It's, it's good. I really liked it. Well, dude, that chess scene was awesome. Yeah, it, it, it dude. was so simple, but like the way Paul Wesley plays Kirk in that scene, every little dialogue that he says just oozed Captain it's, Kirk. It's the confidence. It's the confidence. When he's like saying, Oh yeah, this rudimentary 2D <laughs> chess is just for just for uh I forgot what he they called like simpletons or something. Yeah. But it's like, for idiots. It's for idiots. And <laughs> I'm like going, that's Captain Kirk. Yeah. That is how Captain Kirk thinks. I also like that they I mean obviously that that's part of canon. I believe there was an original series episode where they actually highlighted Kirk's ability to play chess. Yeah. Very well because correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he actually beat Spock. He beat Spock. And Spock wasn't very happy with it. No. But, yeah, that was always a, a talking point among Star Trek fans, that Kirk beat Spock. Oh, People always try to say Spock is the super intelligent one, and he is. He's more the analytical one. Intelligence and being analytical are very different things. Yes. And in a lot of ways, in a scene like that, it highlights that Kirk is just as intelligent as Kirk or as Spock. And not only that, Dave, we all know that chess is a game of strategy. Yes. And Kirk's ability to play chess well has always been an interesting way to confirm his natural ability as a strategist, as a strategist. and master tactician. Well, it's that's why I love that line when he says it's thinking of uh, steps ahead of your opponent. Yeah. And I'm like going, this is the element of Kirk that they have to flourish with he's all this is how I'm gonna beat your uh, your ancestor in the future. Man. In the future. You see how I play chess right now? Yeah. <laughs> you see how what why I'm a brilliant naval tactician? <laughs> yes, because here 
what I'm about to say is days actually equal hours. Hours. <laughs> But that's a, that's the thing uh, I thought was so awesome. Con got played. That that's the thing I really think is so underutilized when people think of Kirk. They think of William Shatner. They think of the character mannerisms and the characteristics, and not realize that Captain Kirk is one of the most capable captain nav- uh, officers in the Federation. There's a reason why he was given the 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 command of the Enterprise. Over yeah. Spock. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. He's not a real character, but uh, you mean writing-wise, writing justification. Wise, justifi- yeah. Justification-wise, there's a reason why he is in the position he is. The writers have continued to show and give us examples as examples to why. Examples of his intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. And pairing Leanne and Kirk together worked better than I had originally anticipated I know they had been promoting this episode since last year. I want to say during the season finale, the week that the season finale aired, the actress that plays Leanne went on a, I think she's in love with Paul Wesley. <laughs> because remember we were talking about this? Yeah. Cause she was gushing yes. over him on social media and it got a lot of us excited because she was talking about the scenes that she shot with them and that she can't wait for everyone to see it. And now I know why. Because it was great. And the actress that plays Leanne and Paul Wesley obviously have great chemistry on screen. Yes. It really worked. And I'm all about things that make sense, even in subtle ways. I said during our introduction that this episode felt a lot like a companion piece or possibly a, a, an homage an homage to the city on the edge of forever, which, like I said, is an excellent episode. And if you haven't read that adaptation, you need to check it out. But it's a beautiful story. So it is. So leaning on an episode like that and you're creating a companion piece and for all intents and purposes, you're you're also using those similar emotional components as well. At the end of the day, what we get is a really good episode. The way the episode ended with Leanne crying. Yeah. I mean, that was very reminiscent of the IDW adaptation. Yeah, where Kirk is in... He stares off through the the, the port. Yes. In his, with the window, whatever they call it on the starships. Forgive my lack of uh, memory when it comes to terminology. He looks out into space and he's all, but I loved her. But I loved her. And, and then it, it ends. just ends and there, it, it, the shadows of his face where it looks like he's crying. Yeah, he's weeping. yeah. So that's the feeling I got when Leanne reached out to Kirk and, you know, she's struggling with this. She, she wanted to rekindle something. something. She wanted to see if they can possibly be friends in this timeline. And the fact that she's unable to, because remember, she cannot tell anyone yeah. what she just been through. She can't even tell Pike. And yeah. it's like that moment, I think this might be blasphemous. Oh. I think that moment was more powerful than the Kirk one in City on the Edge of Forever. Because... That moment the, when Leanne... The, you talk about the actual episode. Yes. Mm-hmm. When Leanne realizes that he's alive, she's thrilled. She, you can see it in her eyes that she's happy he's alive. But in like brief moments, she goes from completely happy to completely distraught because she can't tell this man that what happened because she's not allowed to. Yeah. And if she does, it could affect the temporal, you know, temporal peace yeah. among the galaxy. I thought they were going to have some relations oh, in easily, the past. Dude. And easily. then he dies, but she has a non-existent Kirk's child. <laughs> this is this is not soap operas, Mike. <laughs> this is fan fiction this in is, the making that's right here. fan fiction right there. But like, And she's going to name him Other David. <laughs> other David, <laughs> that's so bad. But David I, too. I I honestly think the performance of I forgot the actress's name who plays La Anne. Yeah, I I don't have it in front of me. That scene was brilliantly done because she went through so many emotions in a tight window. Christina Chong. Yeah, Christina uh, Christina Chong. She went. 
she showed her range completely really nice. She's really good. Honestly, David, I think she might. Uh, listen, I, I love all the characters in this show, but I'm, I'm speaking sheerly uh, from a thespian aspect here. She might be the best talent of the actors mm. on this show. Oh, that's David, tough. That's she, tough. She's dude. she's got some she's got that emotion down. She's got the emotion down. Now don't get me wrong. I mean, this I, I, you one know what? episode it's too early. Fanta- it's just too early to say. Yeah, this because episode because Jenna Bush is is that her name Jenna yeah, Bush? Yeah, Jenna Bush or Jess Bush. Jess Bush is fan You can't rule out Pike. You can't rule out Anson Mount. A- a- mm. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to strike that from the record. I think I was just seeing boobs for a second. <laughs> <laughs> or even, you know, even like last last episode with Rebecca Romaine. She did fantastic in yeah. that, that one. Yeah, you know, I'm just going to delete everything I just said because there's so much great talent on this show. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. We said that last episode. It's kind of like, uh-huh. I don't know how in the world Strange New Worlds pulled it off, but out of all the casting... Of all the series in Kurtzman's era, Strange New Worlds has the strongest casting out of all of them. And Discovery, I would, you know what? Please do not throw, you know, pitchforks at me, Star Trek fans out there. Yes, I love the TNG crew. They're fantastic. I did, there are moments that I got really emotional during Picard season three. Mm-hmm. But the casting in Strange New Worlds is probably better than Picard. Well, it's also a different type of acting. It's far different from different acting, decades. But these actors are from the modern generation. The next generation crew is from a time when you did a different style of acting. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Acting has evolved. That's why when you watch the original series or any show from the 60s or 70s, it's very different. It's very different. So... All right, we are running out of time, so we need to get into this Noonien Singh aspect. <laughs> so the Institute for Cultural Advancement. When I saw that sign, I figured something big was going to happen, and obviously it did. The writers of Strange New Worlds have changed, David. Big things. Canon-defining aspects of Star Trek. But... They cleverly inserted a cheat. Yes. Things can change, but as the Romulan time traveler said, there's something about this timeline, the prime timeline, no matter how many time infractions have occurred, which we've witnessed a lot, things that were supposed to happen always end up happening. Yes. Even if they are pushed pushed further down the timeline. Down the timeline. And she specifically mentions the eugenics wars that were supposed to have happened in 1992. And now she's been here for 30 years waiting, waiting. And it's been pushed back by some force. And that is how they explain Khan being a child in the 21st century. I like this for several reasons, but my like doesn't negate The cautiousness that they must, they must exercise caution as they move forward. Because there's certain things that they could do that could absolutely destroy the franchise. For one, and the reason why I like this, for one, it privileges the prime timeline as how things should and must be. Whereas the other alternate timelines are simply strands of time that occurred because of accidents or other anomalies. Yes. And the reason why I like this aspect, David, and this is something you and I have talked about off and on when it comes to multiple other IPs, because we're in the era of the multiverse and alternate realities, split timelines. What happens is you start to water down the importance of the actual timeline, the main timeline that most the bulk of our stories take place. Yes. And when you do that, when let's just use Marvel as an example, when you say Iron Man is on this universe, but then he's also over here and he's also over here and he's also over here. And we can go to that character at any time. It waters down the relevance and importance from a story perspective of our key Iron Man. And the same thing applies with Star Trek. When you have all these splits 
and you realize, oh, Kirk's over here too, and Kirk's over here, and Spock's over here, oh, and Spock's over here. It negates the importance of the prime timeline. Mm -hmm. But with the wording of this episode, where the Romulan time traveler says that things keep happening how they should, suddenly it, it puts back into, in, I guess in a metaphysical or cosmological sense, it puts fate or destiny back into Star Trek, which that's how I always viewed the mirror universe. We, had ta we have talked about this in, at length, David, about how the reason why the mirror universe is only slightly different, meaning one is good, one is bad, and that's pretty much the only difference. You still have Spock. You still have Scotty. You still have Chekhov. And the likeliness of having the exact same people on the exact same ship with the exact same names in a split timeline is close to none. Oh, yeah. Unless that split, scientifically speaking, happened at the very specific moment that you went to that universe. Because as we know, the butterfly flat effect, one little thing happens differently, everything unravels everything and changes. Unravels, yeah. So the likelihood of having these split timelines where Kirk is an actual captain on an Enterprise, just it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. Yeah. But actually, when you put it into context of like what they said, where it's of like fate and a destiny. fate and destiny yes. is pulling these characters. Correct. It's one of the things that I really liked from the it. It was an element that got introduced in J.J. Abrams reboot. Yep, I knew you where, were gonna go there. Where J.J. Abrams at the very end basically said these elements have to happen. Pike has to end up in a chair. Kirk has to be the captain of the Enterprise. Spock becomes his first first uh, officer. You have Bones becoming the medical officer. All that has to fall into place. And it was time repairing itself. Yes. And I've always liked that about Star Trek because in all the franchises and geekdom, Star Trek's the only one that actually has embraced this idea of one centralized time uh like prime universe because they call it the prime universe and there's always been that overarching idea that things will still happen that have to happen you have to have a klingon war you have to have the romulan war you have to have the the dominion war the borg have to show up james t kirk has to exist yes yeah, james Spock t kirk has, has to, to exist. unite romulus with the vulcans it's it's kind of like the end of Voyager. Yes. Janeway has to accept this is the destiny of her crew, but she can push and nudge that future further. Well, David, same thing with the season finale for Strange New Worlds last year. Old Man Pike. This is not how things are supposed to be. Yes. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be here. It's the timeline fixing itself. I like that they're reasserting that idea mm -hmm. because it brings relevance to the prime timeline. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised, David, if sometime soon or in a few years, they eventually explain that the prime timeline is the actual timeline. It's the original timeline, and all these other alternate universes are simply fractions off of this timeline. I'm worried about if they try to do a storyline like that where they try to explain it because it could be very convoluted. Oh, absolutely. Because like <laughs> it's dangerous territory, it's, David. It, that is I feel that is more dangerous territory than them bringing in Captain Kirk and the original crew. Yeah. Dealing with trying to explain the importance of the prime timeline that could be a jump the shark moment. Yeah. No, I agree. And that's why they have to be very careful as they proceed. Now, the second reason why I liked what they were doing here is it works with Picard, or I should say is because it works with Picard season two a lot better. During our discussion for season two of Picard, we had mentioned the eugenics war that was supposed to have occurred in the 1990s. Yes, in the 90s. And how there was no real noticeable fallout of a supposed war that reportedly based on everything we know of Star Trek, 
rocked the foundations of the government institutions of the world. Oh, it changed humanity. It changed humanity. And yet here we are in Picard season two and we don't, what we see is a world that looks very similar to ours. Mm -hmm. So having this new aspect pushing this idea that, that things that needed to happen will happen, but it just got pushed back. Yes. It actually fixes my issues that I had with Picard season two when we didn't see any of this this aftermath. We didn't see the effects of this eugenics war per se. Now it makes sense. Because the eugenics war took place further along the timeline. Correct. We don't even know if it's even happened yet. Yeah. Now we do know that there's been various temporal war, or I should say eugenics wars. A lot of people are under the impression that there was just one, but I believe it's always been plural. There's been a few. And then enterprise at one point alluded to the fact that there was a third leading into world war three. Yes. I could be wrong about that. I'll have to check and if I'm sure the, the fact checkers out there will also reach out and let me know. So there was an article from Den of Geek, which isn't one of the the best blogs out there. <laughs> However, they did explain a couple things a little bit better than yeah. I can currently because I'm exhausted. So I'm just going to read from the article where they explain this new temporal war that was introduced. He says, we learned here that Romulans had been trying to slow human progress in an attempt to prevent the Federation from ever forming. The Romulan agent, disguised as a human, points out that if she kills Khan, the Federation never forms. She also reveals that all the time travel to Earth's past has probably created a slightly alternate timeline, which is our prime timeline. So it isn't exactly the original timeline that we have seen throughout the last 60 years there are very there are already little variations yes which i think is an interesting little cheat because now when we point to say we point to something and say i don't know if that works well there's little variations in the timeline that's why i said the writers were clever they have given themselves ways out of certain problems which this is something we talked about. When you're dealing with a franchise that's almost 60 years old, you're going to, at times, write yourself into the corner. So you're going to have to be smart how you write. And this is one of those examples when you can create potential cheats, potential ways out. So the it continues by saying it's almost as if time itself is pushing back and events reinsert themselves. All of this was supposed to happen back in 1992, and I have been trapped here for 30 years. This is why Khan is a child now. Is a child now, in the so. 2020s, rather than already an adult and in a sleeper ship out in space. Yes. So right there, it's already changed. They have changed Star Trek canon. Yeah. This suggests that maybe the original timeline of the original series, he says maybe, it's it's not maybe, it is. It is. In which the eugenics war supposedly happened in the 1990s has now been pushed to the middle of the 21st century. And the reason why it isn't a retcon per se, because temporal wars have altered the past. Yeah. So it's still going I buy to that. Happen. I buy that because yeah. there has been so many changes because of this, these temporal wars that I would buy the fact that there are going to be slight changes, but the, the things that must happen will or happen. Will happen. But the way you get there might be slightly different. Mm -hmm. But th that, I think, dude, I think that is a genius way of dealing with your, with your continuity. Yes. It's a genius thing of bringing it, bringing it into today's world. E right. N but now... David, this is the, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to try to get through this quick. Okay. This brings us to the big question here. This is the thing and you the, alluded the, the to. The theory that we had previewed at the top of the show. It brings into question the retconning of the original series. I can't remember if I had mentioned what I'm about to say on a show. I might have said things because I've been going through these thoughts for quite some time now. 
But I know you and I, David, for a fact, have talked about this. Oh, yeah. I know we've talked about it. By changing Khan's origin story, even though they've asserted that things will happen as they are supposed to, Spock's words in the original series clearly says that the eugenics wars started in 19, in the 1990s. Yes. Now it doesn't. But no matter what, they can't go back retrospectively and change what Spock said. So they have retconned parts of the original series that now are inconsistent. It actually doesn't work. Yes. There's only one way of fixing this. <laughs> now, just to be clear, by stating that things will happen as they should, there might be variations, but the big events and character-defining moments still stand. I'm fine. Yeah. With changes like this. However, it does retcon portions of the original series, and it's hard to look the other way. And since this was done, in not a subtle way, it wasn't an accident. It was purposely done. They all, everyone over in the writing room knew exactly when the eugenics war started. Yes. And since this was done, I have a feeling... And this is the theory I've discussed with you, David. Mm -hmm. The powers over at Camp Kurtzman seem to be working towards a possible reworking of the original series. Giving yeah. us a whole new five-year mission that works in step with the 1960s series but offers new insights. Yes. I think that that is the game plan, which I am totally for. This very well, David could be the end game as we know star trek as a franchise as far as mainstream appeal go mainstream appeal goes has always relied on kirk and spock yes. it's what people know so it seems logical to work towards such an endeavor and if you take notice you can see that the pieces are already there yes they introduce kirk they have yeah. uhura they have spock they have already introduced the idea of Scotty in the season finale. It's not too hard to start bringing these characters together to where we eventually get Kirk on the Enterprise. Now, I'm not suggesting they actually remake the original series, but they take all these new variations, these changes throughout the last 60 years, and they work within the gaps. Yeah. So they essentially redo the five years, but they don't actually redo the stories unless they have to. We all know things happen in between episode one of season one and, then and the, episode two of season one. Yes. What happened in between? Even there, better, There's going to be other adventures. There's things they talked about. Yeah. Even better, Mike, think about it. By doing this, they could honestly give us the... The original concept of Gene Roddenberry, which was a five-year mission. Correct. The complete five-year mission. Not like what people don't understand is the original series is incomplete because it was canceled before it could complete the five-year mission. Yeah. So in essence, they can actually go back now and do what Roddenberry originally planned, a yep. five-year mission. Yeah, and... I'm not, uh, if someone asked me, hey, should we do this? Hey, Michael, just, you know, I'm Kurtzman here. I'm going to ask, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, remaking the original series and re redoing it or working in step with it uh, from a different perspective? I'd say no. But we are here. Yes. And we know that the original series is dated. And we also know that Kirk and Spock are the big swing and dicks in the world of Star Trek. And up to this point, Mike, the writing team and the production team of Strange New Worlds, if you were to tell me they're going to be the ones that actually going to, let's, let's see what it is, reboot the original series, would you, would you be comfortable with that? I would say yes. I they've would. Proven, I would be comfortable with it, yeah. They've been proven to be a responsible and, well, uh, a very talented core of uh of of writers writers yeah i'm not saying i like the idea necessarily but it does seem like it could work and it could win me over i'm open to it i am open to the idea i like this kirk i like this spock that strange new worlds has introduced us to 
knowing the star power that these two characters have from a business perspective, let's forget Star Trek fans for a second. Pretend you're Paramount and Viacom. They know that those Star Trek films were massive hits for them. Yes. Back in the day. Next Generation, the jig is up for them. I don't <laughs> feel like they can make a movie and it really blow up at the box office. No. Because unfortunately, I, the fan base and the the actors, they're, they're being aged out. Typically, you need to target the younger generation. The younger generation. If you want those box office dollars. And a next generation crew, as is, wouldn't necessarily grab that target audience. However, yeah. a young, hip crew like Strange New Worlds could very well be their ticket to success for the future. And, uh, I'm not talking about at this moment, but they could absolutely work there and get there because Kirk, it's only a matter of time before we get more Kirk, and we can't rely on J.J. Abrams' Kelvin timeline to continue those no. storylines because who knows what's happening over there. So Plus, unfortunately, those actors have gotten older. They, yeah, and they're, they're all, not, yeah. They're not going to be able to actually, if the game plan is for a long-term investment into a cast, I honestly think, yes, within time, you could do a big, you could center the original cast around Paul Wesley and Ethan Peck. And, uh, I mean, even if they just do like event series, you know, for, for, Paramount Plus. I, I honestly think those days are numbered just because streaming services are really trying to crack down on the amount of money that they're spending on content. Yeah. But who knows what the future holds. I wouldn't have a problem with that. I know I'm the one that preaches about new things, <laughs> that we need new things, need not new things. redoing what we've already seen. However, I'm also able to see things with a business mind and this is logically sound yeah business wise i don't know if you were to announce this if it would work with fans immediately they would probably throw a shit fit but guys it's already happened in strange new worlds but they uh, literally changed a defining moment in star trek but i definitely think it'll work with the, what they're doing because they're doing it slowly yeah, and they're 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 easing their way in, and the idea of the temporal war and the variations to the timeline, it makes sense. It makes sense. It justifies certain changes that may happen down the road. All right. Well, you know what, David, this does bring us to the end of our discussion. I want to thank everyone for listening. Be sure to find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Rayman Digital and pledge five dollars or more a month and you'll gain access to additional shows, our pre-show, all types of Star Trek content that we do. Uh, David, before we close out quickly, just give me your score. My score for this one is a solid 95. I love this episode. This episode was really well done. Trying to compare this to the other uh, other episodes is tough. I'll have to wait till the end of the series. But right now, I love what they did here, and I love the 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 performances by the two lead actors in this episode. It was beautiful. Yeah, ninety three percent for me. Strong episode. This series is very strong. It's a great Star Trek series. The writers definitely have a handle on what Star Trek is and is supposed to be. I'm a little nervous with some of the ballsy decisions they're making, <laughs> but it seems like it might work out, but only time will tell. On that note, that's it for us. Thank you, David. Thank you. Live long and prosper. <laughs>